And then finally, the delta brainwave state is really equivalent to a coma. It's that deep. We only get a few minutes of it every night compared to the other brainwave states. And this is, of course, where we're going in Nidra. And this is where human growth hormone is released. The organs are regenerated. Um, the brain, even the brain gets regenerated. So it's the most restorative state. This is where we're going every night in Nidra, in sleep in Nidra. Namaste. You're listening to the Savana Podcast. Join us on an exploration of Eastern spirituality, yoga philosophy, and conscious living for the new age. This podcast is a production of SavanaSpirit.com, where you can find a large selection of Om and yoga clothing, spiritual jewelry, and unique fair trade gifts from the Far East. Now here's your host, Ashton Subbo. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the Savana Podcast. As always, we've got a really great show in store for you today. But before we dive into our topic, I want to remind you to go over to savannaspirit.com slash contest to enter in each and every week for our weekly contest. You get a chance at winning a $100 gift card for anything from the Savannah Spirit store. Now, our topic today is Yoga Nidra. Most people in the West are familiar with what is in essence Hatha yoga practices, but yoga nidra is a form of yogic sleep, conscious yoga sleeps. You're actually going to sleep consciously. Our guest today is Kamini Desai. She's a yogini and teacher who combines the ancient wisdom of yoga with modern psychology. She's the education director and curriculum developer of the Amrit Yoga Institute and author of Yoga Nidra, The Art of Transformational Sleep, as well as the book Life Lessons, Love Lessons. She holds degrees in anthropology and psychology. Kamini, welcome to the show. Thanks so much. So you had quite a, a bit of a, a unique childhood, I imagine. Uh, your your father is a, a famous yogi. Uh, he's the, the founder of the Kripalu Institute, Amrit Desai. Uh, but I, I've heard you speak as well that you, like most children, kind of went away from what your parents were doing and then eventually it came back. But I'm curious to hear how having a, a, such a, a prominent yogi as a father influenced you growing up and then how it influenced now that you are a, a yoga teacher how that influenced your teachings and the specific insights that you bring into what you teach. Yes. Well, I think, you know, when you're in, when you're growing up as the daughter of a guru or anybody else, it seems normal at the time. And it's not until you look back and realize, wow, that's not the same background or environment as everybody else that you kind of appreciate what you got. Um, So I think that the advantage was to be kind of surrounded, um, receiving these teachings by osmosis, Um, Not necessarily that he was sitting down and saying, okay, learn A, B, and C, but just by virtue of living in a community, hearing the teachings every night. Um, One of my earliest memories is my mom would would take me up to satsang, the, the evening talk, and I would fall asleep on her lap listening to the teachings of yoga. And I remember, I must have been six or seven years old, and my dad said to me, well, do you understand what what I'm saying? And I said, of course I do. (laughs) (laughs) So, of course, that's a six-year-old mind is different from a 49-year-old mind. But but on some level, I think I was absorbing it. So we're going to be talking about Yoga Nidra today. And in your book, you call Yoga Nidra a secret door to liberation. I was wondering if you could summarize what Yoga Nidra is and explain to us why you call it the secret door to liberation. Yes. So in one of the uh, the ancient texts of Yoga Nidra, the Mandukya Upanishad, <clears throat> they actually describe the foundational basis of Yoga Nidra really well. And they say that when we're human beings, we always exist. We're in three states. We're either awake, we're dreaming, or we're in deep sleep. And we just repeat, wash, rinse, repeat through these three stages. But what they said is that the state that we enter into in deep sleep is is not the same as the fourth state, the fourth state of awareness or, um, you know, the super consciousness that we talk about. It's not the same as this fourth state, but it's the doorway to the fourth state. So in sleep, if we go there consciously, we experience the self, uh, the container that we are, the expanded self that we are, the super consciousness minus all the contents. And through the vehicle of conscious deep sleep, we get to experience who we are, the container minus the contents. 
And we get to rest as that, we get to abide as that. And then we bring back that knowingness of our container-like nature back with us to the waking state. And of course, you know, there are many ways that we describe liberation, but really it's resting as that container, that which is prior to all our thoughts, feelings, emotions, experiences, uh, that fourth state of consciousness. So it's actually not my word, the secret door. Um, they say it's the doorway too, but I love it because every time I read it, it gives me chills. That, that it's a doorway into this expanded state of consciousness. Now, a lot of people in the West that are familiar with yoga tend to be more familiar with yoga as hatha yoga and, and the physical postures. You, you emphasize a lot, at least in your book, the idea of liberation, which I, I think fits in well to the conversation that adds to all of these various health benefits and whatnot that, that it brings. But if you ask the average Westerner why they're walking into a yoga class, I, I don't think liberation is high on their list. Most people, I mean, that are going in for the physical practice are there for flexibility, which is a whole other topic. But stress reduction is another big part. And, and, and stress in general is a really, uh, it's an epidemic in our culture today. How does Yoga Nidra help approach this, this problem of stress with our modern culture? Yeah, well, you bring up a really good point. And this is one of the reasons I love Yoga Nidra is that it really is, its benefits are accessible to anyone on any level. So you don't have to be interested in liberation. And in fact, most people aren't who come to Yoga Nidra and they're really looking for this management of stress to sleep better, to take care of their health in an easy, accessible way. Essentially, what happens is that most of us, without even realizing, we're building up accumulated tension day after day, week after week, and we think that the amount of sleep that we're getting or the amount of rest and relaxation we're getting is balancing out the accumulated tension, but it's really not. And what happens is we create this backlog of excess tension, which we adapt to and don't even realize has become a problem until suddenly we have stress-related symptoms. And we think, well, why can I not sleep? Why do I have anxiety? Why do I have blood, high blood pressure? I feel fine. But the problem is that it has built up slowly over time. And so the beauty of Yoga Nidra is that it does two things. The first is that it induces a very deep parasympathetic relaxation response that allows the body to release that excess accumulated tension um, in a very powerful and accelerated manner. So it's said that 45 minutes of Yoga Nidra is the equivalent of three hours of sleep. So it gives you that, that restorative, rejuvenating benefit, but kind of on steroids, um, which I know the average American person at least likes, you know, you're, you're getting and that. Now you're talking about they could be more efficient with things. Now, now you're picking the, people's exactly. ears up. <laughs> um, so, so that's one of the, the pieces of it, that it's, it's highly restorative. But here's the other thing about Nidra. It is a meditation technique. So it's also allowing us to relate differently to our stress producing thoughts, because for most of us today, the, the stress that we're experiencing is not coming from an actual threat to our physical life. It's coming from our mentally induced stresses are the things that we imagine, the stories we make up, the worries that we have. And the problem with that is in a real stress your body was made to be stressed for 60 to 90 seconds at a time. But with a stress that we keep in our mind, <clears throat> something that's mentally created, that mentally stressed could stay for days, weeks, months, or years, as long as we choose to keep it. Um, and that's what creates this excess accumulated tension much more than the body can balance out. And so the second benefit of Yoga Nidra is that it allows me to change my relationship to these stress producing thoughts that are continually bringing me back into this excess stress cycle. Um, so it's working at two levels. It helps me relieve the excess tension and also helps me create a different relationship to those stress producing patterns that we have. You mentioned sleep as well. And I grew up with horrible insomnia as a child. I mean, there are periods and times in my life where if I was getting two or three hours of sleep, that was considered a lot. Uh, it, it created a number of challenges as a child in terms of waking reality and just like walking around like a zombie, all kinds of stuff. And while I, while I don't suffer from insomnia anymore, I can fall asleep whenever I, I want now. It's not a problem. I also can function with very little sleep. Uh, I, I tend to only get about six hours of sleep a night, and that's that's totally fine for me. And a lot of that now, though, I credit to pranayama exercises, meditation, all these sorts of things. So I was wondering if we could dive a little bit deeper in the conversation of how yoga nidra makes sleep more efficient, or uh, we could say kind of lessens the requirements of sleep. 
Mm-hmm. Well, um, the first thing that you said, and we'll definitely get into what you said as well, um, is that whole thing about sleep and insomnia. And it's actually estimated that 1.5 million Americans have insomnia. So this is a big deal. And um, of course, everyone has different sleep requirements, but most of us don't realize how just how important it is. And most of the growth and regeneration of our brain, of our organs, memory consolidation, our ability to not only learn material, but recall it later, that all happens in sleep. And so if we're not getting quality sleep, everything gets affected. And in fact, um, it's been shown that uh, people who don't, people who get enough sleep versus people who don't actually have lower body fat. Um, If you don't get enough sleep, it can increase your chances of type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. I mean, it's crazy. You just wouldn't even realize. So um, this benefit of yoga nidra kind of giving you the accelerated benefits of sleep is really, really important for people who have sleep debt or disturbed sleep or insomnia. And the, the idea is that how it works is that every night when we go to sleep, we go down through progressive brainwave states. And we go through these brainwave states, uh, we cycle through them about four or five times a night. And what it seems that what's happening in yoga nidra is that we go through this cycle more quickly at a more profound and accelerated rate than we would in sleep, therefore giving us the effects of three hours of sleep in 45 minutes. So this is really great for us overachievers <laughs> who even want the, the greater benefits of sleep. But I'll tell you that Nidra is like filling your gas tank. It, it, whether you're exhausted during the day or you're a new mom um, or you just you work you know, late shifts or those kinds of things, there's disturbed sleep for some reason. It's a really great way to prevent the effects of sleep loss and, and the health effects of that. You were just talking about brainwaves, and you go quite into depth about brainwaves in your book, so I'd love to expand a little bit at that as well. Could you explain the, the, the various brainwave states very briefly and just kind of talk to how you, you, you touched on it there a moment ago, but you, you mentioned too of like the, the difference between the, the, the alpha rates when you're sleeping versus when you're in uh, the, the yoga nidra state and how that all kind of works together. Sure. So generally speaking, first of all, all the brainwave states that we go through as human beings are helpful and useful. And we want to be able to shift gear shift down and up through all the brainwave states in a healthful way. And back to stress, when many of us are stressed, um, we are in the beta brainwave state. When we're awake, we're in the beta brainwave state. But what happens is, is that if we have insomnia or are excessively stressed or have a lot of anxiety, Um, The alpha brainwave state, which is relaxed alertness and also taking us down into sleep, we don't have enough alpha brainwave activity to actually bridge the gap from waking into sleeping. And so the alpha brainwave state is where most people are in traditional meditation, in mindfulness, they're in the alpha brainwave state. And this is where serotonin is boosted, your immune system is boosted. Um, This is where that bridge happens into sleep. And um, for a lot of people who have the stress or insomnia, this is what's keeping them from sleeping. Also, as we get older, we have less alpha brainwave activity. Um, So this is a really important one for our health. Um, And yoga nidra, of course, boosts our alpha brainwave activity. Um, And it helps us make that bridge down into deeper brainwave states, the next one being theta. And in the theta brainwave state, this is where kids live here. So this is where we have super learning. You know how kids, they say that they'll learn, you know, 90% of what they're going to learn in the first two years of their life. This is because they're totally open and receptive. um, And that's the state that we enter into in the theta brainwave state. It's also the place where um, creative ideas come up. You know, it was either Edison or Einstein who had a cot in his laboratory and said his best ideas came when he was in sleep. So this theta brainwave state is where, you know, how ideas come to you, answers to questions, problems that you have. And then finally, the delta brainwave state is really equivalent to a coma. It's that deep. the the most restorative state that we enter into. We only get a few minutes of it every night compared to the other brainwave states. And this is, of course, where we're going in Nidra. And this is where human growth hormone is released. The organs are regenerated. um, The brain, even the brain gets regenerated. Um, So it's the most restorative state. So yeah, this is where we're going every night in Nidra, in sleep and Nidra. So for people that are entirely unfamiliar with Yoga Nidra or, or experiencing it for the first time, how does yoga nidra differ from kind of regular guided meditations? So the main thing is, and it's it's interesting, but it's designed in a particular way so that it works from 
I don't want to get too yogic on you, but it works from the gross to the subtle. And it's designed to work through something called the koshas, which are subtle layers of being. Feel free to get all yogic, all, all you want on this show. No problem. Okay, great. <laughs> so a yoga nidra is designed to set up to work through the koshas. Um, so if we first work with the physical body, then, so we do like tension and relaxation, maybe a little bit of stretching. Then we work with the energy body, which is, surrounds and infuses the physical body via the seven chakras. And we do breathing techniques to really supercharge the energy body. And as the energy body gets supercharged, it gains enough momentum to kind of escape the gravitational pull of the next kosha, which is the mind. So usually the mind holds our energy captive. It's it's using the, the energy body's energy, it's fuel. But when the energy body gets strong enough, the mind becomes quiet, energy becomes stronger, and it pushes past the mind. The mind creates gets very, very still, and we move into the wisdom body where we we where we practice being the witness. And then eventually we enter into the bliss body where we experience you guessed it, bliss, <laughs> um, the sense of complete wholeness, oneness, and unity with all things. And then finally, we go even beyond the sense of I amness at all, where the sense of I am dissolves. And we go beyond the bliss body, beyond any sense of body-mind into the, our ocean source nature itself. Um, and this is where actually it's said that spontaneous healing happens. And then as we come back out, we come back through the bliss body, we plant an intention at the bliss body, because it said that the bliss body is the causal body, it's that which acts as the blueprint for all the others. We come back through the wisdom, mental energy and physical body, but now with a knowing of our and a connection to um, that which is beyond our body and mind, our source of nature. So I guess the big difference is how it's set up through a series of breath, body and awareness techniques to very in a structured way, move us through these koshas to the source and back. Speaking of structure, you, you talk about the six tools of yoga nidra. I was wondering if you could just very briefly for us summarize what those tools are and how they link together to create this sort of cohesive experience within yoga nidra. Sure. Well, as you said, you know, not everybody's interested in liberation who does yoga nidra. Um, and so the ultimate tool of yoga nidra is really as a tool of recognizing my true nature, the secret door to liberation. And that's the first tool, which is realization. But not everybody's up for that. Um, and the second tool of yoga nidra is that it provides the sense of disidentification. So even if I'm not resting completely as my source nature, yoga nidra allows me to deconstrict from the thoughts and feelings and emotions and able to see them as something that's outside of me rather than that is me. And so having that little bit of a gap, I can look at the thoughts and emotions and choose to engage them or not, maybe cravings, addictions. I have more space to go with them or not. So that's the tool of disidentification. And once I have that ability to see what that habit or impulse or instinct is, I can use intention to redirect. So usually we try to change things from our willful brain, our willful mind, but our unconscious habits will undo it. And so we use intention um, prior to the mind to be able to make shifts through the body mind. So that's the tool of intention to redirect where we want to go. And then we have um, relaxation, which we talked about, that deep parasympathetic response that happens in the body. And it's, you know, it's the easiest way to get, your, to get healthy, optimize your health. That's not to say you should only sleep, but sleep is important. Um, so that's the relaxation com component. And then we also have integration. So that's to say that actually, as you go into these states, just by lying down and breathing deeply and going through these techniques, you're actually releasing me mental and emotional tension that have been held within you and they just get naturally released out of your system. Um, so it's kind of like a detox flush, kind of like a dream acts on you. It does something similar. So it releases the mental and emotional debris that's held in your psyche. So that's the integration piece. And then finally, we have restoration, which is if you don't believe in the rest of it, <laughs> science has proved that yoga nidra reduces your blood pressure, reduces cholesterol, releases DHEA and melatonin and serotonin, oxytocin. Yoga nidra actually releases as many as endorphins as running does, believe it or not. Um, so it's just plain old good for you um, in terms of the biochemistry of your body. Now, for, for people that don't have access to a, a yoga nidra class or 
uh, you know, even just someone where, or where they can get the, the, the script, as it were, that takes them through all this. How do you recommend for people? I remember I've done a lot of shamanic training as well as yogic training, and we used to have recordings of drums so that we could, if we weren't drumming ourselves, we can't go in these states. So we'd, we'd, we'd listen to it. Or if we were drumming ourselves, we couldn't go in these states. So we had to listen to it. Um, do you recommend that, that people record themselves or get recordings from others? Or, or what's a way that people can do that that might not have access to in-person live yoga nidra sessions? Either one of those is actually a really good idea. You can record yourself um, with a script or you can, um, there are plenty of, of Yoga Nidra recordings out there. We recommend that rather than guiding yourself, the only thing that you don't do is like guide, try to guide yourself through it. Because the whole idea is that is to move through it from a state of doing to non-doing. So if you're trying to think like, okay, what am I doing next? Is it the right hip or the left hip? What am I breathing technique? You're still doing. Um, so what we want to do is come up um, with some way that you're receiving the guidance without you having to think it. It should be just received directly and non-mentally. So either with a guided CD or one that you create yourself. And what do you feel is the, the, the greatest benefit of yoga nidra? I mean, with, I'll, I'll take away the, the response of liberation because that, that's kind of the easy one. It's like, what's the, your happiest day? It's like, oh, the day my child was born or something like that where, I mean, that's the go-to. But uh, because th that from at least uh, the, the inception point of yoga nidra is the goal. But for the, for the average person that's living in the world today and they've got their, their issues, what do you see with, uh, with everyone that you teach these techniques to? What's the, the, the most noticeable thing that, that people walk away with? That's a good question. I think the thing that people tell me that they notice the most as they begin to practice is this second tool of disidentification, where they actually have that little bit of a gap between themselves and their automatic reflexive way of being in the world. So whether it's, you know, just a little bit of space between you and getting irritated with your kids or, um, you know, letting your boss or your employee have it, there's just that little bit of ability to go, do I really want to go there, right? Rather than impulse comes into the mind and a knee-jerk reaction, we start to feel a little bit more empowered and able to see that, wow, you know, just because I have a thought or an impulse, it's not pushing me around. I'm not under no obligation to act on it unless I give it the power to. So it gives me back the power to have thoughts rather than my thoughts and impulses having me. This is the big difference that I see. That's something as a yoga teacher as well that I notice is truly beyond flexibility or, or any sort of stuff that most people come for is the real essential tool of a yogic practice because especially in our modern lives, people, unless they have a practice like this, go through their whole lives thinking they are each and every one of their thoughts. And every time that it comes up, that's them. So they have to react to it. And so they're caught in this vicious cycle where they're never taking the moment to step away and witness that. I always view the mind as like a, that, that drunk neighbor that's like always yelling out just the most ridiculous things all the time. If you recognize that your mind just yells out the most ridiculous things, then you can pause and be like, ooh, do I really want to respond to that? Do I really want to engage that thought? But if you don't have that recognition, then you're going to sit there and think, oh, those thoughts are me. And therefore, it just impulsively comes out with everything. And I think that I, I love to hear that you say that with being such an important tool or an important aspect of, of Yoga Nidra as well, because it, it really does shift. It doesn't matter what you're doing. If you're trying to get more flexible and hatha yoga or get more relaxation through meditative techniques, whatever it is, you can't do those things if you're busy thinking all of your thoughts and caught up in that mindset anyway. So it is so important to have that, that step back where uh, I call it like the, the response versus the reaction, that, that gap that you just spoke of, of that moment in between where you can actually, instead of just react, you have a moment to respond and that, that, that's super beneficial. Now, you, you've, you've got this amazing book that, that came out on, on Yoga Nidra. Where are some other great places for people, uh, again, because mo most people now in, in our day and age in the United States can, can walk down the street and, and find some type of yoga place happening. Uh, there's a lot of stuff online as well. Um, you have a, a website. You've got lots of information online. Uh, you're also a part of uh, the, the, the yo or excuse me, the Amrit Yoga Institute. Where are some places that people can go to find out more about Yoga Nidra? And then where can people find out more specifically about the work that you do? 
So Yoga Nidra, I would go um, on YouTube. We have a YouTube channel, Amrit Yoga Institute. Um, and there are, there are all kinds of free Yoga Nidras that you can be guided through. There's a lot of teaching on there, all free downloaded stuff that you can, you know, study to your heart's content, uh, in addition to the book, obviously. Um, and I have Yoga Nidra CDs, oh, guided Yoga Nidras up there as well. And then there's, of course, my website, which is Kamini Desai. It's my name, K-A-M-I-N-I-D-E-S-A-I.com. Um, and that also shows either at the Amrit Yoga Institute or, or with me I travel around the United States and also uh, in other countries as well, giving trainings and, and workshops and things like that. So um, that would be another way to learn more. Awesome. And, and I, I definitely encourage people to get your book. It, it is quite packed with with information as well. You really get into a lot of the science behind the work with Yoga Nidra, which as a as a natural born skeptic, I always appreciate when there's there's the the flowery nice stuff and some some science to back it up, which is great. And you have a, a script that you use at your institute in the back of that as well. Would that be something that people could go through and record themselves so that they could could listen to that? Would that be another good way to start? Absolutely. That would be the recommendation. I mean, if you're really wanting to lead other people, then I recommend that you take a training. But this is something that you could record for yourself um, and guide yourself through. I think it's very powerful to actually hear your own voice guiding you through something like this. It can be very nice. And when when's the next training that, that you have coming up? Uh, the next training we have coming up is actually uh, early March. Um, so that's coming up pretty soon. Uh, which, next by the time this one gets out, that might be up. So maybe the next one. <laughs> okay. The next one after that will be, uh, we'll have one coming up in the fall at the Amrit Yoga Institute. So that might awesome. be a good time. Yeah. Thank you so much for, for coming on the show and being with us today and, and sharing your, your knowledge and understanding and passion. And we really appreciate it. Thank you. And for all of our listeners out there, I hope you have learned something new today. I hope you go and check out Kamini's website and her amazing book, Yoga Nidra, The Art of Transformational Sleep. Thank you all so much for listening today, and I hope you all have a very present moment. Namaste. Hey everybody, it's Ashton here with an announcement. We're starting a weekly contest giveaway over at Savannah Spirit. If you'd like to enter into the contest to win one of our weekly prizes, go to savannahspirit.com slash contest. If you enjoyed listening to the podcast today, we'd really appreciate it if you went over to iTunes, left us a review, leave us some comments, and share this podcast with anyone who you think might enjoy it. Also want to invite you to go check out Savannah East, which is the name of our blog and also the name of a Facebook group where I interact with guests and our audience we will post recent episodes up there as well as interesting articles relating to our guests and or the topics on the shows. And again, thank you so much for listening. Namaste. You've been listening to the Savannah Podcast. To find out more about Savannah, go to savannahspirit.com or follow Savannah on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Savannah Spirit. For daily inspiration, check out our blog at savannaheast.com. Be sure to join us next week for a new episode. And thank you for listening to the Savannah Podcast.